Lord. Are you excited about the kingdom? Are you excited about the kingdom? Are you excited about the kingdom? Now, you see, I see all of you as ordained ministers. Now, we talk about missionaries and guys that have the titles, but you are all ordained to go into the marketplace, into where you live and wherever you are, and touch people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means that you need to be the best warrior that you are, that you can be. Uh, you, you need to know spiritual karate and, and uh, every kind of boxing technique that you can put together, how to handle your words and how to conduct yourself. Can I give you the beginning class? John Acts and Romans. That's the Bible in condensed form. John is salvation. Acts is, it should be called not the Acts of the Apostle, but the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And Romans is the best description of the Christian life that you can find in one book. Now, that's, that's the introduction. Instead of getting them to start in Matthew or Genesis and read the genealogies and get lost before they get started, John Acts and Romans. And uh, I, I tell you, it's a powerful tool uh, to just get started. You talk to somebody, you believe in God, uh, you believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Let me tell you, let me give you an idea of where to start uh, and just read these three books and see if God will talk to you. Because you see, uh, if, if they really will open up, God will get them by the ear <laughs> and, and bring them forward. And they'll, they'll, there'll be some things that, but folks, Here's something we sang about. I'm a friend of God. There's a, a covenant. There are 15 different covenants in the Old Testament. But I want to talk about just one. There's only three verses of, in the Bible about it. But it's the covenant of salt. And uh, I, I want you to look at it with me, if you will, very quickly. And then we're going to talk about a, a subject that is very important. And that is the covenant that we have with God. And here, here's, here's where I want you to look. In 2 Chronicles, oh, just a minute, we're going to go, we're going to go forward here. In, in the book of, of Leviticus, Numbers 18.19, it says, Numbers 18.19, it talks about the covenant of salt and something that's established forever. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 2, verse 13, it says that salt that you have with your God, 18, 19 of Numbers says that salt should be included in every sacrifice. All of those rituals, all of those sacrifices, the Old Testament, they had to include salt. Now we jump over to the second Chronicles, chapter 13. And I would like to uh, read to you just one verse. Verse 5, 13, 5. But you're going to be able to just kind of peruse it during the preaching and maybe read it when you get home. It's, here's two kings. One is the king of the north over the Israel, it's called and one is over Judah, and the king of Judah decides because of uh, the king of, of uh, Israel, has, and he's a usurper, he's not a true lineage of, of the household, uh, he's a usurper as a king, and he, he opened up things, he said, anybody that wants to be a priest, all you've got to have is enough money to be able to get your own sacrifice and set up your own altar. And no matter where you came from, no matter what you were, you can be a priest unto God. But I don't know what God it was. And, and so uh, the, the situation was that the king of Judah decided he was going to go out against the king of Israel. And he, he raised his army. And all of a sudden, he's got 400,000 soldiers on the battlefield. And here comes the king of Israel. And he has 800,000. How many of you know that anytime you start to do something for God, the devil's going to raise up his ugly head. He's going to do what he can. Okay? And so uh, here, here it is. Uh, this king of Israel, instead of depending on his 400,000 soldiers 
our military strategist, he hits his knees, he gets before God, and they fast and they pray, and they look up the word, and here's what he brings out when he tells the king of Israel this in 2 Chronicles 13, 5. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of Saul. He was saying, you're not a descendant of David. But the covenant of Saul is still in effect. Now folks, when Jesus was here, uh, he talked out about us being the salt of the earth, and he called us his friends. And I believe that this covenant is a covenant that is so important to you and I, because it is a symbolism. The only covenant that's in in uh, full operation today is the covenant, the new covenant that we have based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, But these covenants are, uh, are little facets, like the facets of a, a precious jewel that causes the Christian life to really shine for you. And this is something that really happens in our lives. And so the covenant of Saul is a very interesting covenant that, that I begin to look at, and one of the aspects, the aspects of the covenant of Saul, and I, I, I preached this on several occasions in different places. I remember in Fresno, California, pastor, the church pastored by Abraham Rababi. I preached this in his church. Abraham Rababi was a missionary from Lebanon, and uh, uh, he uh, left Lebanon because of the war. But he lived, he and his wife, his American wife, lived through many, many years of the war going on the turmoil in Lebanon. And I got through preaching about the covenant of salt and, and uh, the, the, uh, using some Brazilian illustrations and so forth. And he stood up and he said to me, said, uh, I don't often add to what someone says, but I want to add this because it was a personal experience in my life said it came about that the Muslims came through Beirut where my wife and I were pastoring and we were in our home and they gave us instructions, don't go outside the home. For days and weeks they could not go outside their home because they were Christians and the Muslims were killing all the Christians that they could find. And, and so uh, they, they ran out of food, they didn't know what they would do to eat and do you know what happened? There was a box of food on the doorstep every day, just enough for the family to eat every day. And it went on, I don't know, he didn't specify how long, but it went on for a period of time. And when the, the, the thing was over with and they could go out again safely, they went out and he recognized the man that was bringing the food to him. And he went to him and he said, you and I were members of a gang together. And I would like to know one thing. You're a Muslim, and by your religion, you have full right to kill me. And the man turned to him and said, But Abraham, you and I have salt together. Amen. Now, folks, the Brazilian people have a saying that they say that you can't really know a man until you've eaten a kilo of salt with them. Now, how many of you know that salt is not that good by itself? <laughs> you put, a, put some salt, and the Brazilians like to salt down a piece of meat and put it on the fire and barbecue it. That's their main season, just rock salt. Put it on there and barbecue it. Have you ever tried it? Well, uh, what I'm trying to say to you tonight is that the greatest thing that can happen, no matter where you are, no matter what goes on in your life, you have salt with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Have you had communion at His table? Have you confessed Him as Lord and Savior? Uh, is, he, is He really and truly your King? Is He really your friend? If He is, you can count on it. I don't care what comes your way, what comes my way. We have salt with the King. We have salt together. And uh, I, I, want you to, I want you to realize something, that there, there's something really powerful. Now, just to give you a little bit of a picture of this, uh, of what happens when you have salt. And David had, the, the, the descendant of David had a covenant of salt that he invoked. And the king of Israel, he thought, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that strategy. The devil's full of strategies. 
The world's doing everything they can to keep you from being a solid Christian. They're trying to erode you. They're trying to corrupt your children, to corrupt the educational system, corrupt our value system, corrupt our, our morals, and force us to accept homosexualism, and force us to accept immorality as the norm of life, and, and uh, uh, it, all of those kind of things. But the, the, the thing of it is, is that we have a covenant with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you can live an overcoming Christian life. You can live victorious. And, and so the, the, the thing that, that really and truly happens in our lives is that the king of Israel, he put out 400,000 soldiers right to face the 400,000 soldiers. And he sent half of them to one side uh, of the other 400,000, half of them to the other side, and they set up an ambush. How I many of you know that the devil is a specialist in ambushing? Yeah. Uh, he, he, he wants to hit you from your blind side. He'll hit you from the back side. And, and every way that he can. But the secret is to go out like these people did. They, go, they went out knowing that I am in relation with relationship with my king. I'm not going to do anything unless he says to do it. And then when he says to do it, I'm going to do it the way that he says to do it. I'm going to march forward and I'm going to see things begin to happen. You know what happened that day when they met one another on the battlefield? 500,000 soldiers of the enemy fell. The king fled trying to get away and he did not get away. He died because of his poor strategy, his immorality. Folks, I want you to know, it may look like that you're not popular. I, I can imagine what kind of uh, a fear went through the crowd when they saw there was 800,000 soldiers on the enemy side and only 400. Uh, but, I, I, you know, there's a, there's a lot of preaching in that. Uh, we, we can see the, the angels of the Lord encamped around, around the ballast. But what I want to get to tonight is a quality that is so profound, is so powerful. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. And again, this is a wicked king. I'm telling you, they, they had some wicked kings in, uh, in Did you find it? Yes. I didn't, so let, let me have time to find it. Second Chronicles um, uh, 16, 5. 9, I'm sorry. Now here's what it says. Asa was a wicked king, and Naiah goes to him with a word, and this is so profound. You wonder why God blesses and prospers people? Why God favors people? This is one of the qualities that God's able to identify in you that really and truly confirms your covenant with God. It says in verse 9, 16, 9 of 2 Chronicles, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong, on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Or in the King James it says perfect. Uh, and so that, that word loyal. And the, the rest of that verse he said. Uh, and I stopped at the end of the sentence. But uh, the rest of that verse he said. In, uh, in this you have done foolishly. Therefore from now on you shall have wars. Now here's the quality. There's a lot said about it. When I started studying Bob Sorge's book on loyalty, I uh, went to the bookstores in Brazil and picked up five books on loyalty. Every one of them, loyalty was taught as a whip that somebody beats you over the head with. I mean, you know, you gotta, to be a part of the group, you gotta be loyal, you gotta be loyal, but there's a difference between commitment to the program and being loyal. Loyalty is a quality that you and I have to give to who we believe in, to what we believe in, yes. and when it and, and, and the real proof of your loyalty 
It's not when things are going good, but when things are not going good. When it looks like that everyone and everything is against you, and you've gotten report that the person that you believe in, or the group that you believe in, is not doing it right, and you're ready to throw up your hands and quit, but all of a sudden you said, God, I am loyal. I'm committed. You see, John the Baptist went through this, and, and he... he uh, uh, was tempted because I want you to know folks is there's nothing that affects leaders more than to see their leadership diminishing and John the Baptist he had a tremendous ministry leadership he had thousands of people coming out to be baptized and all of a sudden an upstart by the name of Jesus was taking his crowd away from him and they they wanted to find out why. They wanted to check it out. But, uh, I'm sure if it had been in modern times, they'd have called in the, the, the analysts, the consultants, and evaluation. They'd done studies and run, run all kinds of charts and all kinds of things on it. But one of the things that, that John the Baptist had, he had a quality of loyalty. He had a, they, came, they wanted him to, to let them worship him. And he said something that is so profound. He said, I am the friend of the bridegroom. Folks, oh, think about this. A friend of the bridegroom. He said, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. And I rejoice that he's going to be with his bride. <laughs> now, folks, there's nothing greater. Now, I know that I'm talking to some preachers and I know that one of the biggest temptations there is is to the glory and the love and the compassion and the commitment that people have, they give it to you. Can, can I, from the time that Israel told uh, the, the uh, prophet Samuel that we want a king, we have been running after kings. A king that sings good, a king that talks good, a king that has a good lineage, and we, we, we worship men instead of letting Jesus be our friend. Is Jesus your friend? Is Jesus someone that you're loyal to? Is, uh, now, the proof of your loyalty is how loyal you are to people that you have given your word to. You see, folks, uh, we, we, make, we take it very lightly in sickness and health until death do us part and sometimes a few days later a few years later I don't love you anymore we're not together I'm not with it you're not doing what I thought you're not as pretty as I thought you were you're not as wealthy as I thought you were and, and we throw it away because we do not have loyalty we can't keep our own word we need to fall on our face and ask God to forgive us. Now, if you've broken your loyalty, and this uh, this is really interesting, and I don't have time to get into it, but the book on loyalty, he taught, and, and and this is very important. If you come from somewhere else, if you've been committed to a different ministry, you've been involved in a different church. <clears throat> Pastor, can can I go ahead and say this? Yes. This is going to hurt. You shouldn't even be here unless you've left with their blessings. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. Yes. Now, you say, well, uh, they wouldn't give me their blessing. But there's a process that you can use that will make it possible for you to leave in peace. If they categorically refuse to give you your blessing, just that is a blessing. See? And so you can, you can have loyalty and keep going because, brothers and sisters, the greatest quality that you and I have is that we vote with our feet. We, we, we've argued over the years and uh, they, they made it legal now that 16-year-olds can vote in Brazil. They don't even know what they're doing, but they're voting. Uh, they, uh, we had a big fight in America to let the women vote and it uh, looks like the women know more about voting now than the men do. And <laughs> And so uh, we, we, we make all of these issues, but the real quality is, do you come 
to this church because there's a pretty sign outside? Do you come to this church because it has a good ad on the internet? Because it has a, a beautiful TV spot? Or, uh, no. You probably came here because someone told you about it. And you find a place that you can be fed. You find a place that you can be fulfilled. You find a place that you can be involved and committed. And folks, I'll tell you what. I do not believe in bench polishers and, and pew warmers. Uh, uh, I, can, can, I, can, I, can I get off track just a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, we, we got the idea. A lot of people say, wow, this business of having to pay tithes. You don't have to pay tithes. 17 times in the Old Testament, tithes is in the plural. Why? Because there's more than one. There's three tithes. Two of them are everything. 10% of everything. So that's 20%. And one of them is every three years. So 33 and a third. So 23 and a third percent of what you have coming in. And a lot of us... Have, uh, you say, well, uh, what's, what's the New Testament principle? Jesus set over by the treasury. This is a proof of your loyalty. Jesus set over by the treasury and watched them putting in their money. And I know because there were devout Jews there that put in their 20 or 25 percent. And he didn't say a word about it. Uh, even if they calculated to the to the very T, the mint and cumin and ants and all of those things, they they had it right to the point. But a little old woman came by and put in all she had. And he said, That's what I want. Yeah. You say, I want to be a Christian. I want to serve God. How much is it going to cost me? How much do you have? It only costs all that you have. But when you give all that you have, all of a sudden the eyes of the Lord that are running to and fro over the face of the earth, he said, yes. Job got in trouble because God saw that he had a quality that he was looking for. He was looking for loyalty and he found loyalty and he turned around the devil. Have you seen my man Job? <laughs> uh, don't go ask God to put you on the spot like he did Job but ask God to give you the quality of loyalty that if it comes to it he could put you on the spot and you'd come through with flying colors. Job got to the point he said if God kills me I'm still going to serve him. I asked a guy, he's having business problems, and I don't know why. I love him. He's been good to me as a missionary for 20-some-odd years. He's fixed my car for me. Uh, uh, my transmission went out of my car. And it's going to cost $2,000 to fix it. I found, he, he called me. I called him and, and told him how much I loved him and appreciated him. He said, I found a way that I can get a used transmission. It's only going to cost $500 and, and, and some dollars, and I'll put it in for free. And... and <laughs> And, and in the conversation, he said, Pastor, when I got acquainted with you a few years ago, you asked me that if, if I would lose everything that I have, would I still serve Jesus? And he said, I want you to know I'll still serve Jesus. I'm closer to Jesus than I've ever been. And he lost his home. He's lost all kinds of things. But folks, uh, the real proof of what we are and who we are is when the things get tough. Because you know what? The people that have loyalty, they get going. Yes, they, do. they lock it down and they go forward and they stand strong and they stand tall and they stand in the face of the opposition and in the face of all of the circumstances that, they, that has come against them. God is looking for men and women that have a quality of loyalty that makes it possible. Now, can, can I talk to you about a uh, kind of loyalty and it goes across cultural lines how many of you read the book of Ruth yes. Yes. yeah Naomi uh, and Ruth Naomi and her husband they got in trouble the nation was in trouble they were having a famine and they went across to the Gentile city, took up their abode, 
It so happened their sons married Gentile girls. Folks, I want you to know, some of us as families are so messed up we don't know. Now, here they are. They live in there. These guys are working hard. But both of the, her boys up and die and leave two widows. And I want you to know, I believe both of those daughter-in-laws love their mother-in-law. Yes. Both, what was the other one's name besides uh, Orpha? Orpha and Ruth. They go outside the city. Naomi's going back home. They found out that the famine in, in, in Israel is over with and there's bread in the house. How many of you know that there's bread in the house? <laughs> she found out that there's bread in the house. She went home. She found out uh, the, the reason I left Oklahoma to come to California is to get the money off the trees. <laughs> Pe peaches and, and apricots and prunes and, and cherries and grapes and... and uh, it was really hard money, you know. <laughs> it was hard to get. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta be quick. But, but uh, uh, here we are. These two daughter-in-laws go out to the outside of the city, and they're both weeping. Orpha says, "Mom, I love you. I love you, but I'm going to stay here because Naomi said you you can stay here if you want to." But Ruth said something that described a quality of loyalty that is profound in the annals of history. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. And where you die, I'll die. <laughs> Folks, I want you to know there's something about commitment about loyalty that goes beyond the circumstances, that goes beyond what's going on around you at the moment, the, the fad, the, 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 the popular thing. And I know that we have fads and popular things going on, and we can take advantage of those things to win people to the Lord. I told you about one this morning about uh, dealing with the headbangers and getting hundreds of them saved and filled with the Spirit. But uh, I wouldn't advise you to go on that journey unless you're ready for the battle. <laughs> it, it, it's really a challenging time. But folks, if you want to do it, if you want to do something to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've got to be willing to risk it all. You're willing to put it all on the line. Now, uh, this sounds like I'm bragging, but it is a fact of life. When we move to Brazil, and I advise missionaries to do otherwise, but we sold our home. And when we got all the bills paid and things, we had $5,000 left. When we got to Brazil, we moved into a home that was not finished, not walled in, no security, no protection, no, uh, the, all kinds of things not fixed. And we spent our money doing things to the house. No mission department paid us back. Nobody gave it a special government credit for doing it. But we did it because it was for the good of our family and because we were committed to preaching the gospel in the nation of Brazil. Now, folks, are you committed to reaching your family? Are you committed to, to reaching your family to the point that you're willing to give up some meals, that you're willing to to go the second mile, you're willing to ask forgiveness, you're willing to demonstrate qualities of, of commitment to those people. Now, can, can I talk about something that really is deep in my heart? You see, we don't believe in homosexualism, and often we have someone that's in the family in some place down the line that is involved in this perversion. You know what we do to them? Morally and spiritually and every other way we shoot them. You're worthless. You're a piece of trash. You're, you're going to hell. You, and how many of us have the courage that in spite of their perversion to love them? Yes. To go beyond yes. what they're doing yes. and say, 
I don't agree with what you're doing, but I love you. Do you need something to eat? I'll give you something to eat. Do you need a bath? Here's a place to take a bath. Do you need clothes? I can, I'll can. i get you something for you to wear. Folks, there's something about loyalty that goes beyond what people... You say, well, uh, he's a drug addict. She's a she's a prostitute. They're, they're, they're involved in criminal activity. I want you to know the greatest thing that will pull people out of the fire of hell uh, is you care enough to stick your hand in there and pull them out to get a hold of them and say, I believe in you. I'm willing to, to go the second mile with you. You see, that's that's what discipleship is. Uh, that's what commitment is in, in our lives. Loyalty is a quality that Ruth had. You know what happened to her because of her loyalty? A, 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 a guy, a rich guy, he told his field workers, his name was Boaz, he said, leave a little on the edges on purpose. Why? Because he saw someone that had a quality that she was being loyal to her mother-in-law. Oh, na ma I feel that. She was being loyal to somebody that she didn't really have to be loyal to. Yes. After all, you're no blood relation to me. Uh, you don't have any more children. Yeah, I, I can't marry somebody. But God brought something to pass in her life that she became a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ because of her loyalty. Amen? <laughs> oh, I tell you, that, that, that's, that's something. Uh, she... She took the steps that was necessary. She became an instrument in the hands of God. And God has chosen you. You are not here by accident. You are not here just because you've been swept in by some strange circumstance. But I'm saying to you that if you have the character to commit to this ministry, to this work that is going on here, and you're willing to commit what you have, there are are thousands, not hundreds, but thousands and hundreds of thousands of people's lives that will be impacted in this generation. Folks, I don't know if you realize it or not. I travel almost all the time. I'm going into churches. I don't put a limit. I don't say, well, you've got to have 200. I, I don't care if they got three. If they invite me to come and preach, I'll go and preach for them. And, and because I'm committed to advancing the cause of the kingdom. But the most of the churches that I go into today, uh, the, there's no young people. It's heartbreaking. Why? Because the kids don't want our fanatic religion. And come to find out our fanatical is stuff that we're fanatic about that's not even in the Bible. Mm. Oh, if you can't say amen, say oh me. <laughs> it, it, it's time we wake up and realize that if we're going to be... A, 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 how many of you have heard of a guy by the name of Ron Luce, a ministry called Team Mania? You know what he said about the young people of today? 80% of the young people today are godless. Why? The most of them growing up in Christian homes, around Christian schools and Christian television and Christian radio and Christian music. Why are they godless? Because they haven't seen our loyalty. All they've seen is our patent place hypocrisy. Now, if you're a young person, you wouldn't know what Peyton Place is, but if you've been around a while, you know what I'm talking about. But it, it, it's, it's serious, folks. It's time that we get down and we sort out things because here's what I really believe, that there are inalterable principles of the Word of God. And I've said it, and I'm going to say it again and again, that if you can ferret out those principles and build your life on those principles of the Word of God, and you can see God begin to do things in your home, begin to do things with your children and with your grandchildren, and with the kids that seem like they were lost, all of a sudden they come around and say, Pop, uh, 
I know that, I know that we haven't talked much, but but uh, would you pray for me? Would yeah. you would you would you remember me? I, I tell you what, folks, there's something happening today, and and we we expect some guy to to come in with a briefcase and a smooth bunch of words to say and bring us revival. But revival's got to start at home. Revival's got to start in the house, and it's got to start with a quality called loyalty. Loyalty to God. Jesus is my friend. He said. We are his friends. <laughs> Brother Pastor, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where to quit. I, I just I, I'm telling you that this this is something. You you see, we're in covenant with God. And we're in covenant with God in such a way that God will not change his mind. He will not change his word. Uh, I I uh, I've heard of a preacher talking about petting his cat. Yeah. Anybody here of Bob Mumford? He's telling about the guy that's petting his cat. And, and he's petting his cat the wrong direction. You know? And every time he petted the cat, the cat would fuss about it. <coughs> Didn't like it. And he told the cat, he said, if you don't like the way that I'm petting, you turn around because I'm not going to quit. You see, God's not going to change his mind. You can't get him to change his mind about it. it can, can, oh, <laughs> you see, Jesus, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. Verse 19 and 20 is one sentence. There are four verbs there. It says, go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. Yes. Now, I don't have time to go into all of that, but I want to, I want to just do the teach. Jesus didn't just say teach. So in class on Thursday night and, and uh, computer class on Tuesday night and, and we'll have a prayer meeting if enough people come out on Wednesday night. And, and uh, uh, what did he say? Teach them what you want to? He teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What does that mean? One, one pastor in, in Sao Paulo, he said to me, he said, uh, I asked that question, he said, well, just preach the red letters. Oh. And I thought, he didn't miss it far. <laughs> Another guy by the name of Lance Walno that I was talking to you about the seven mountains, uh, uh, and he said, well, that what it is, is that they did, we did an analysis, and Jesus commanded 50 commands in the New Testament in the Gospels that he taught that were modifications or uh, superseding the old rules and old, you know, he didn't say if you pray, but he said when you pray. He didn't say if you give, but he said when you give. He didn't say if you fast, but he said when you fast. You see, that's, that's a, a change from the old way of doing things. So we got to learn the Bible way, the principles of the Word of God. And Jesus said, uh, he made uh, 50 clear statements that, that we can understand. And uh, I, I tell you folks, it's time we get a hold of it and begin to, you say, well, where can I start? Start with the Sermon on the Mount. You know where they ask? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And, and you'll find some things in there that'll, that'll cause you to, you know, uh, we think, well, the Beatitudes, I'll take that, the first one and the fifth one and the eighth one, but they're all just a stepping stone to getting closer to God. It's all part of it. And Jesus said, teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You want to find out who's really loyal? You know what God's looking for is somebody that's, that's saying, and, and folks, I want you to know, we do not come, become cognizant of these truths. And, and there's a very important thing. You see, it's one thing to know something. It's another thing to understand it. And it's another thing to put it into practice. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh God, yes. wake us up. Yes. Wake us yes. up. You and I have the key to revival in our lives, in our home. Uh, instead of wasting ourselves on internet and, and television and diversion and, and entertainment, let's give ourselves to God wholly, completely, 
to say, yes, Lord, a hundred percent. Not, yes, not uh, the father of the discipleship movement, Juan Carlos Ortiz, told about a guy that uh, uh, was become involved in discipleship and one of the things that characterized discipleship back then, and I think it characterizes it today, is that they had to give everything that they had. And the guys took his, he gave his uh, uh, everything that he had. He gave his home, gave everything that he had. And, and so he goes to the pastor and he goes he starts to talking with the pastor. He said, Pastor, I've, I've given everything that I have, given my home, given my car, uh, and uh, all of these things. And, and my wife and children are living, we are living in a trailer house. The pastor said, you mean you have a trailer house? Yeah, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe this modern stuff that's being preached today is not, not that, please, not that, not that uh, hard. But I'm not being hard, I'm being real. Because you, you see, when you really commit yourself to a way, to a belief, you're not saying, well, now I'm following God and all you can see in your life is just a set of heel marks. God's dragging you along. You got to go to church. You got to give your money. You got to. You got to. Got to be. Uh, you got to get. You be kind to your enemies. You know. And you do if you have to. And, and uh, I, I'll. I'll live right if I have to. If somebody don't see me stealing, I'm going to take a little. Uh, and, and if somebody don't uh, hear me, uh, catch me in a lie, I'm going to twist the story to make it fit for me, folks. Let's have revival. Let's start it where we are. Let's start it with a quality that God is looking for. Is a quality of loyalty yes. now it works both directions because uh, I hate to say this but how many of you have friends that you can trust oh don't raise your hand I'm going to get my feelings hurt Can you really tell them, you know what? I, if I had a chance, I'd have an affair. Can you really tell them what's going on inside of you? I found a thousand dollars on the sidewalk and put it in my pocket, put it in the bank. It's mine. What is a friend? Who is a friend? We're, we're talking about the covenant of salt. We're talking about a quality called loyalty. And it's the kind of thing that is 100%. Now, uh, salt is a preservative. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, it is worth nothing but to be thrown out, to be done away with. Now, folks, uh, uh, God's looking for people that have loyalty. They're looking for people that are salty, people that are seasoning the life that they're a part of, and they're willing to stand. I'm not talking about blind, ignorant, uh, standing against one another, but men and women that are, are willing to say, well, you know, brother and sister, let's, let's deal with this. Here's what the Scripture says, and what, if this is really what the Scripture says, I want to conform to the Scripture because there's a very powerful biblical principle <clears throat> is that if you follow the Scriptures and you break and conform to the Scriptures, you'll live. But if you have it your way and manipulate it and pull it through, and Victus wrote a poem, I have my head bloodied and bruised, but I will not bow. Amen. Now, folks, I don't think we should have that kind of attitude. We need to bow before the mighty God. We need to say, God, forgive me. God, set me free. God, uh, don't let one negative emotion dominate my life. I'll tell you what, folks, we can't keep the birds from flying over our head, but we can sure stop them from building a nest in our hair. And a lot of folks are letting the uh, hatred and fear and, and, and vengeance and, and, and jealousy and all of these kind of things dominate us and they, they reflect in how we relate to one another. We have envy that keeps us from being able, you know, well, she got a new dress and I didn't get one. And so I'm, I'm you know, and we, we, we let things happen. Well, would you pray with me? Would you pray for one to nine? We need your prayers. And, and uh, I've just about got pastor convinced to let me be a part of the church. 
and uh, I, I want to be a part with you. I'd like for you to keep us in, in your prayers. Uh, Wanda's going to be staying here this time. I'm going to Brazil the 1st of April. But the most important thing is, where are you going? What's going on? And so let's pray. Now, Father, I thank you for your word. Oh, I thank you, Lord, because I don't care how many soldiers the enemy marshals against us. If we truly bow ourselves before you and put you in the place of preeminence, you'll cause whatever we have to put the enemy to flight. They, he won't be able to stand. Lord, you're looking inside of us. You're looking for what's going on the inside of us, Lord. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is showing me someone that has their hand latched onto something that's old, it's dried up, it's dead, the hand is almost dried up, and that hand, if you'll release that hand, God's going to heal you. You say, well, I have a right. They, uh, he did me wrong or she did me wrong. Release it. Open your hand. Open your hand. Open your hand. Stand up and say, yes, Lord. I am willing to be real before you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, I, I just commit this person to you right now. Break that thing that's trying to destroy them, trying to tear them down. I release the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus just now. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord, for, for your work and for what you're doing. Can I, can I obey the Spirit? You see, if you're not a Christian, I want you to come and accept Jesus. But this message has been to Christians. And if in some way, you know what God does with me? He, he, he does an end run on me quite often. I go talking about some, something. And when all of a sudden, somebody on the other side gets something or needs something, but I said, all right, God, I'm, I'm just with it. I'm going to go for it. So whatever it is, if you'd like to have prayer, if you'd like to pray for us, if you'd like to be prayed for, if you believe that God's calling you to a higher level than you've ever been before, I'd like for you to just step out of your seat right now and come up here. Come up here. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God for him to do things that, Man can't do. I can't do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. I don't, it doesn't make any difference. You see, the things that I've preached about, I've preached as much of this sermon to me as I have to you. We all need it. We all, it's so important in our lives for that to come to fruition in our lives. Now, Lord, now, Lord Jesus, I thank you right now. For these that have come forward, for these that are here, Father, I pray that you cause them to be touched by the power of your Spirit, not not by some kind of emotion, not not 